Testing. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Ken Clairbout, K4ZW. Glad you could uh, join us for our webinar tonight, uh, which is being sponsored by the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation. And as always, uh, we encourage you to check out their webpage if you haven't already, www.wwrof.org. And uh, also, uh, we're recording this presentation. Um, it will be posted on the uh, WWROF webpage, uh, along with uh, uh, JC's slides. Uh, we'll, we'll get them up uh, for you as well. Um, I think most of you know how this goes. Uh, we will, you can uh, take, uh, send in questions at any time, uh, but we like to hold them until the end of the presentation just to kind of preserve the, the flow of uh, uh, how things go here. So we have uh, quite a few few people uh, registered for this thing. Uh, I think it was about 237 or so from around the world. Uh, fantastic uh, uh, number of people, uh, a lot of interest uh, in this topic, and uh, uh, JC is uh, someone who I uh, marvel at quite a bit. The amount of stuff he hears and works on uh, 160 is uh, quite amazing. His uh, last presentation he did uh, was extremely popular and uh, is also on the WWROF webpage if you want to check that out sometime. But for now, put your feet up, sit back, relax, and I'm going to kick it uh, down to Florida to uh, JCN4IS and uh, let him uh, show us how to construct uh, the Waller flag. Uh, go ahead, JC. Uh, good evening. Hey, good evening. Hey, guys. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. And I'm going to try to do my best to transfer some details that I learned in the last 10 years uh, working and building and, and playing with the Waller flag. And thank you, Ken, for putting this thing together. It was a fantastic opportunity to join just one place all the, the information that is necessary to put together this beautiful antenna. Well, my name is Jose Carlos, or JC, or sometimes in phone I use Carlos, sometimes in CW I use jo jo Jose. But JC goes well and Carlos goes well. So, so let's start uh, from the last presentation. We, I talk a lot about the high performance receiving antenna for small lots. Actually, this here is the, the view of the NX4D, Doug Waller, and his beautiful Waller flag. And we had a lot of good conversations about different receiving antennas. Like Ken mentioned, the webinar is available on the archives and Worldwide Radio Operation Foundation archives. You can download the webinar, listen to the webinar, and also download the, the slides, because there is a lot of information on the slides that I was not able to cover last time. But just a little update. Uh, since last last webinar, uh, Doug and I will be very active on 60. Doug is really now at 303. 303. He break the barrier of 300. It worked 70 ones last, last year, 2016. And I was glad to work another 10. I, I missed two. There was still think I should get, but it was uh, lightning strikes and, and thunderstorms around. So what we're going to do today is talk about the water flag and very important aspects, but base concept, things that you need to take care when you go with your project. I would like to, and love to support all the projects, but really I can. So that's I, I decided to put everything together. So we're going to talk about phasing line. We're going to talk about the transformers. We're going to talk about common mode noise. And there is several other resources, like videos and things that I recommend you download the presentation in PowerPoint, sorry, in PDF. It's going to come in PDF. And there is the link. So you click on the link, like this one here, that goes to the Doug Waller website. And then you can enjoy uh, the information there. OK? So basically, um, the, the idea here is very simple. We're going to try to understand the problem before find a solution. So sometimes, if you don't really understand the problem, you can get into solutions that does not fix the problem you have, just the problem that you think you have. So we're going to talk about much more uh, the basics and why you need to, to make a decision or not. Okay. So Baba's coming. Basically, uh, what's a receive antenna? That's a very interesting thing about receive antenna. I have a friend they're using a, a delta loop for receiving, 
and he burned the radio and I asked him, okay, what size is your delta loop? Say, oh, it's a, it's a full size. Man, you know how many watts you got into your delta loop when you transmit to it your inverted V? Well, he put a dumb load in a watt meter, it was 40 watts. He was putting 40 watts into your, in his diesel, so of course he burned the front end a couple of times. So it's not so simple. Receive antenna is not the antenna you use to receive. It's an antenna designed just for receive. Basically, every antenna has what called directive gain or RDF. Very common nowadays talk about RDF, but it's the directive gain. And the antenna gain is really the directivity times the efficiency. A lot of antennas have very high efficiency, like Yagis with aluminum is very good material. So, and the directivity gain is the same as antenna gain. And people forgot about it and just say antenna gain. But actually, there is two components when you define antenna. One is uh, the directivity, another one is the efficiency. So the water flag and most of receive antennas in here, we're going to talk really about the water flag, has a very high directivity, like 11.5 to 12 dB RDF. It's very comparable with the three element YAGs. Actually, I was able to measure this in several different places in the last couple of years that I, I'm working with this thing. And it's really equivalent to uh, a uh, very good long boom three element YAGs. And you can turn in all directions. That's why I make this comparison. So, what well, the thing about the receive antenna is isolation between the transmit antenna and the receive antenna. Normally, you should be able to transmit and don't burn your receive or your preamp. So, you need to protect and care about that. But normally, a receive antenna has like minus 20 dB to up to minus 60 dB. So, basically, what's a water flag? Well, we had a long discussion about that on the last webinar. Here is the URL for the last webinar. When they talk about the antennas, if you don't have the opportunity to watch, I recommend you come back and, and just watch the webinar. But basically, a water flag is two loops with one transformer and one resistor. They're called terminated loop. So, mainly, the water flag is a receive antenna with two electrical small terminated loops connect end fire. What what mean is small electrical loop? Means the size of the loop in comparison with the wavelength is very small. So the difference between a regular loop and a small loop is that in a small loop the, the intensity of the irradiation is on the plane of the loop, like here this way. This is the maximum irradiation. And there is a nu on the center. Well, everybody knows like a cubicle quad is a loop or a delta loop, but it's one wavelength. So the irradiation is just the opposite. So somehow when you go to small loops, the irradiation changes in the plane of the loop or perpendicular to the loop. So the water flag is just two small loops with a termination, a resistor, and connect in the fire. So, but the water flag is really nothing new. Actually, if you do a little research, you're going to see this patent for Harold Bev in 1938. He put a receive antenna, loaded loop, is the term, loaded loop. The invention was patented by RCA. They used for a TV broadcast receive antenna. And actually, uh, there is some information on the back of the slides. I recommend you to have a look in that, so you can go deep and enjoy this thing. But if you look in here, uh, could be a circular, could be a triangle, or a rectangle, but all has the same radiation pattern, like a cardioid. And here, even you're going to see there some details of phasing. So that's uh, take for Harold Beveridge. So uh, I can say that water flag is a Harold Beveridge receiving antenna. Actually, there is a lot of people that make a lot of contribution. For, for that antenna, but really comes back to 1938, b before the war. So, what's the size of water flag? I think the very basic question is how big is a water flag? So, let's understand a little more about the water flag itself, about the flag, or, or a terminate loop. So, here is a loop when you have a transformer on one side 
and you have a resistor on side. And the signal on this model comes on the direction of the transformer. Even if you have a U, U actually is half of the flag. If you see it's in the ground and the image below the ground, so if you have a U or a flag, it's almost the same. The difference is on the flag or K9AY or SALA or all those terminate loop, single terminate loop, uh, you have like uh, 450 ohms because the other part of the water flag is below the, the surface ground with the image and works the same way. It looks like uh, uh, two verticals when the signal coming from one vertical because it's too small, has highest WR and, and the current flows on the opposite direction, get here resistor and the dissipate on the resistor is a match, the resistor doesn't match with the impedance and when the signal gets the other way, it's reflected and they get the transformer when you take the signal out. So, but a small loop basically is defined, there is some uh, good literature prowls on antenna book, you can read more, but it's defined but less than one-tenth of the wavelength. So, the terminate loop normally has a resistor and the important characteristic is that frequency-dependent gain. So, the gain change with the frequency, but the frequency is independent of RTF. So, the directivity of the weather flag is very broadband. So, we're going to see that. Like, if you build, let's say, for 160 meter, a very small loop or flag, a water flag with uh, 4 meters by 2 meters or 14 feet by 7 feet. It, this is the diagram of radiation that you can get on EasyNAC. If you build a bigger one with 20 by 10 or 6 meter by 3 meter, you get the same diagram. And if you build a bigger one, 24, you get a, a, the same pattern. So, the directivity does not change with the size of the loop. If you're still below or close to that ratio, 1 by 10, of course, if you have like 160 meters divided by 10, you have 60 meters. So, it looks like a, a loop by 6 by 2. So, 6 and here 6, and here 6 and 2 here, right? Or 80 meters 3 by 1, or 40 meters 1.5 to 5. So you see that uh, a small loop on 160 is quite big for 40 meters and that is the limitation. Like when you start going higher in frequency, the loop start becoming a little different in terms of behavior, changing the diagram. So normally uh, water flag is really good for 160, 80 and 40. You can use on 30 if it's too big, if it's a little small, like this one, 6 by 3, I like a lot this size, and uh, you can use 160, 80, 40, and 30, and they're going to do well. We're going to have a good discussion about this. So, basically, the RDF is the same. Why not build a very small loop? Why don't build a 2 meters by 1 meter, 2 by 1? Well, of course, you can do that, but uh, won't work very well, because the, the real limitation is the thermal noise of the loop itself. So, you cannot go and make a really small antenna that has like minus 80 dB gain and put an 80 dB preamp and that's it. doesn't work that way. Actually, there was a big discussion with Dr. Dallas. He had like Dallas uh, files right now. He put it here in this group. You can find the Dallas files here in the Yahoo group. And there was a big discussion and he ended up really derivating the formula from, from Bell Rules, the classical derivation for ferrite rod, so it's available here on his papers, and that was measured and tested, so uh, we look even with the SPICE model, how it really works in terms of what is the minimum size you can expect a loop to be useful in 160, right? So, basically, uh, Dimension is not critical. This is the most important aspect here. Dimension is really not critical. And we did some measurements with loops like 14 by 7 and with 24 foot boom. And if you live in a quiet place, mean quiet place, really quiet place, when the local noise during the day can be like minus 125 dBm. We're going to talk more about this. 
there was no limitation. It means you still can hear main made noise. Uh, the limitation is really like if you below the minimal discerned signal for a receiver, the signal cannot be amplified. Like if you have a signal and you have a minus 50 dB gain, so that signal can be below the 140 dBm. So during the winter, in a very quiet morning, like today was very quiet in the morning, the thunderstorm was gone, and there was no other source of noise in 160, so things become really quiet in 160 meter. And if you have a very low gain antenna, you may end up with the signals below the, the minimum necessary to be amplified by, by the amplifier, by the preamplifier. So what I recommend normally, those two sides is very proven, works really well. So if you have some limitations, we use four by two by eight or seven by fourteen by thirty. So seven, fourteen by seven is the dimension of the loop, or twenty by ten by fifty. Right? Is is a very uh, proved system. I, I can say like if you leave it in place that is quite noise, you, you prefer to use the small one, you don't really necessarily to have the big one, but if you want to work like 200 countries in any location, you can use the small one, if you want to work 300 countries, maybe you're going to go to the big one. So, but again, dimension is not critical, all size works, but must be symmetric, two loops must be exactly or as close as possible the same. So, this is the original world of flag, Doug put together in 2003, we had a good discussion about that in the last webinar, uh, that is, you see the size, and that size he was able to work GT10160, we are here in Florida, and the signal was coming straight north, through the North Pole, and, and that was amazing, so this is tells us that for a vertical world of flag that size is, is really no limit, no limit in size. Uh, this is the big Weller flag. Uh, I worked several good DX with this thing, like four whisk six alpha in others, and it's uh, quite big in terms of uh, dimension, right? And here is a meter, but it's almost 50 feet from top to top and, and 20 feet high. Actually, when I built this thing 10 years ago, I didn't have the preamplifier I have today, so maybe today we really don't need to be that big, but uh, always help when you have uh, more gain because you need less preamplification and we're going to talk a more common mode noise. So things you need to care about the loop itself when you build the water flag. Oh boy, uh, I, I started with aluminum, all aluminum and it was really difficult. I had a huge noise, especially near sunset, the noise was really bad. It took a couple of years to figure out there was really oxidation. So do you see the little boat with the oxidation here? This was the new one, this with the oxidation. That thing uh, creates uh, like a, a diode. And even if you do protection like this one, uh, Larry uh, WHVVG put a very good work, isolate this thing for humidity, but uh, here in Florida, at least maximum I was able to use is for one year, and all the noise come back. So then I gave up a couple, five, six years ago, and just used fiberglass for the poles, and number 13 or number 18 wire. So Wireman has a very good wire, good protection. I recommend that. It's uh, steel inside, 40% or 40% copper, 6% steel inside, but copper w works really well. So especially uh, in 160 meter, that's another interesting. This noise happens only in 160. That's the, I didn't never saw this kind of noise in 80 or 40 meters. And but on 160 meter, the aluminum oxide is a very bad dielectric, and, and and really can creates a lot of intermodulation and problems diodes. So very raspy noise. So. I recommend you to go fiberglass and, and and copper on the loop itself. So look with the water flag with a little more details. You have the loops, the two loops, right? And you have a 9-1 transformer 
and you have the two resistors. And we're going to talk a little about the phasing line. So to keep the balance and make this thing work, you should use balance line on the feed line. There are a couple options. One, put two RG58 in parallel, just put those shields together and use the center. And that's what works very well. We used that for a couple times. I use also a Belden 2907 Twin X, very hard to find sometimes, but even a zip code can work, so must be twisted pair. So the advantage twisted pair, if you see the, the red and blue, the field generates an each par keeping changing every turn and cancel itself. So the, the twisted pair does not have main made noise. Common mode noise uh, is like a capacitance between the wires and the ground, the common ground, right? Okay, so it's like, like microphone, and the other uh, audio that has high gain, you always see twisted pair. Uh, balance line was very famous before coax and it looks like we, we lost the feeling, but uh, balance lines is very interesting to use. Even if you have like Cat5, you can strip the Cat5 and use the pair inside. Does not last longer, but is a way to use. Cannot use all the parts together. Like the capacity is very important. Like if you have a, a twisted pair and runs on the ground or runs close to a metal, you, you really change the balance and, and you get low reduction common mode noise. So if it, in this case uh, you see the feed line inside the, the loops, if you use aluminum boom, you got to have shielded line. So you have like this kind of lines, the, the RG58 works really well, shielded, because the capacitance between the wires and the braid is the same and doesn't care much what is the capacitance between the two braids and the boom. But if you use fiberglass boom or if you want to keep really as quiet as possible, I recommend you use fiberglass, right? Uh, very important, the chokes, chokes very important. You don't want uh, uh, the feed line to be part of your antenna or the mast. So that's, if you use a, a vertical water flag, you should use a fiberglass mast. If you use a horizontal water flag, you, you don't need the fiberglass mast. Actually, everything about the water flag is the same for horizontal and vertical and I'm going to make a little more discussion about that. So a little, bit, a little more details about the phasing. Uh, what does really mean phasing? Phasing means the voltage in one side is going up and the voltage on the other side is going up. And if you look at this transformer on the or front transformer or this on the back transformer, the phase should be the same, right? So if the voltage is going up in this side, it's going up on the primary, it's going up on the primary, it's going up on the secondary the opposite from the other side, so it is going down. And you see the blue and red, so you put one point when you reverse 180 degrees. That, that's the point. Uh, on the paper, it's beautiful. When you build this thing, you really need to care about the face. And I can tell you, there is only one way you can connect the face correct, but there is at least seven, or even really more than seven. I put here some, some things that is common, like uh, we're going to connect, you messed up and put a blue and blue and red and red and, and you forgot about this 180 degree, then the antenna doesn't work properly. Or uh, you got the wrong wire here on the primer on the transformer or a, wrong, uh, a wrong wire on, on, the, on the loop itself, or you do everything okay but then you twist the loop. So there's several ways to do it wrong and we're going to discuss about that. So for horizontal water flag, I recommend transformer can take like a kilowatt, so big transformers like one inch in diameter at least because you're going to have a lot of energy in those things. For vertical water flags, you don't need much. Same for the resistor. For the resistor on the horizontal water flag, I recommend at least 10 watts. And also very important, isolation. If you use a, a horizontal water flag and you transmit with the same tower, you should have at least 10,000 volts isolation. Be very careful with the isolation between the loops and the tower itself. That's why I use Teflon in most of my isolation with horizontal water flags. 
because if you transmit it with the tower and have a water flag on top, the water flag is going to load the tower. It's like a head. But let's talk more about the transform itself. So uh, I put here some sh little diagrams how to wire those transformers like a binocular. You can have several kinds of binoculars. The ones you buy like a binocular or you can put together like this FT50 B77s. You can be 75 as well or, or 31s. But uh, the important part is keeping the phase. So how, how you keep the phase in that thing? So uh, here is one side and another side. So you know the two phase, so you mark those things. It's important that the two transform is the same. If, if you do something wrong, but make this the same. But how to make the same transformer? You need to look in some aspect, like one aspect of the transformer, like this kind of transformer I like to build. You see uh, four wires in one color, four in another color, other color. So this is actually uh, uh, a transformer that has very broad band. I, I really like to use that thing. So it's like 3 1. So remember, 3 1 and number of turns is the square of the impedance. This is a 9 1 impedance transformer. If you put like 100 ohms to one side, you get a 900 the other side. So when you build a transformer, first thing you need to care is about it could be clockwise or unclockwise. So like when you turn this way, it's clock, anti-clockwise or this way. Uh, the thing is, build the two transformers exactly the same. When you build them the same, you still need a reference. And one good way to do the reference is using the wire coming from the center. So call that your reference. Or you pull a mark. So you need that's the phase you want on the same side of the wall flag. So if it's horizontal on, on, on the right side, if it's a vertical, on the upside. So you need to make sure the two loops, you keep the face. And then there is only one point when you reverse. The, the point to reverse is here on the center, right? Because you have access to the center of the antenna most of the time. Okay, so if you do everything right, how, how you know that the phase is correct? That's the first important point. So. Uh, when the phase is correct, it's 180 degree. So this is the diagram when you have 180 degree. So you can see the gain is very small. So like minus 55 dBi, front back 25, front side 27. It's a good front side. If you screwed up the phase, and of course the only option you have zero or 180, then you lost the front side. You see the gain is also big difference because here the gain is 27, and here the gain is 37. So like 20, 20 dB difference between 55 and 37. So you, you notice the antenna is very noisy if you get it wrong. If you, if you want wire breaks, very common, sometimes wire breaks, and you lose one loop, you're going to see a lot of gain, and you see the noise up. So it's good to measure the well reflect. Actually, we're going to see how to measure it with the evaluation. So this is how it looks like when the phase is correct. This is the, the diagram. And this is like a one loop, like a, a K90Y or one flag. If you put zero, it's like parallel two. So you lose a lot of directivity. Instead of a 74 or 80 degree, you get like 120 or, or more. So uh, let's go into more details about the construction. So here again, the, the water flag. You have the transformer, front transformer. I go front transformer because the signal comes this way. And front resistor, so resistor on, on the loop on the front. The back transformer and the back resistor. You have the phase, you see the phase in line here on the actual antenna in front of the, on the paper. You see the phase in line working very close to the resistor here. And you see, if the true phase is the same, the center of the phase is not exactly the same point you have the mast. And also, you have the choke. Uh, there's some distance here between the, tr the twisted pair and the choke, so you need to care. So uh, what I recommend here, I use a non-inductor resistor. Keep the res reactance very low. For vertical water flag, I recommend at least 3 watts. 
So near 900 ohms, and, and for horizontal water flag, I recommend 10 watts or near 1,000 ohms. Uh, keeping the impedance low here, I mean, sorry, uh, the loop with low reactance, that's why I recommend close to 900 and 1,000, 1, because the impedance here from the transform is going to look much more like uh, uh, real, we know so much reactance. So that's important because the SWR on the feed line is always important, on the phase line. If you make this thing and don't get about the SWR, the current distribution could be completely different from the one you see on the simulation. So uh, talk really about the resistor. Uh, the front resistor, you can play a little, but make the resistor on the back 10 to 20 ohms higher than the one in the front. That's for to keep a little better uh, front back. So if you keep them the same, you have the best broadband, uh, very deep nose, and if you put like between 10 and 24 ohms on the back resistor, it's equivalent to have a phasing line 175 degrees. Instead of use 180, use 175. So when you increase the resistor, Things, two things happen. First, the front back increase. So say, oh, I'm doing good. Actually, you're going to see later that it's not really the case. But the RDF decrease. So when you increase the front back, you open up the front lobe. So the RF decrease. So there is like a, that's why I recommend no more than 10 to 24. If you use like 50, you start losing the side nose as well. So that's not good. And the RDF goes down and the side nose. So this is a kind of resistor I recommend. NATA has a 3 watt metal film that works really well. We use the resistor for almost uh, 13 years right now. And for the Weller flag, I recommend those uh, no in inductive resistor, no inductive resistor, 10 watts. Uh, percent is very important. Look at the 10, 10, 24 ohms in 1,000. We talk about really uh, close to 1%. So you need to measure, actually measure the resistor and take care about rusting the leads or things that low temperature drift, those things are very important. So talk about uh, the phase line itself. So if you look into the phase line, like I told, it's very important to keep the phase line always below 1, 1 1.5 or better. So keep it low because if you make some mistake like here on the 1-1 one, one transform, you put like three turns and four turns and, and that's enough. One turn wrong is enough to okay, create a huge imbalance and you don't see the diagram. Actually, the beautiful roller flag, you can measure the diagram so you have an idea how that thing is working because you can measure it. So uh, the feeding line, if you keep the 180 degree, you have the best broadband, so like the two sides, the line in the front and line in the back, the same. If you use like 175 degree, it means the the line in the front is a little short and the line in the back is a little long, right? If you go that way, you're going to increase front back, but you reduce directivity. And if you go the opposite way, make the line in front a little longer than the line in the back, you, you, the front back's not so good, but you increase uh, directive, increase RDF. So there is a, that's why I like 180, because it's the best performance between different bands. Remember, when you move from 80 to 160 and 40, if you put like three feet of wire here, the angle is going to double with the frequency, because the, the, the dimension is the same, but you're changing the frequency. So mainly, uh, what I can say, if it's a vertical water flag, you should optimize for maximum RDF, you pay the resistor. The most important is to keep the local noise low. So you look into the elevation angle on easy neck. When you do the simulation, use a very low elevation angle, trying to best front back or on that low angle. But if you look horizontal water flag, the idea is to reduce main main noise. So it's to optimize if you make the two resistors the same and the two lines the same. So there's no much change here for the horizontal water flag. Well, anyway, one, this is very important. The water flag is ground independent. If you have the antenna uh, three, 
or 30 or 120 feet above ground, the SWR will be almost the same. So if you measure low SWR in the ground, then put the antenna up. Don't put the antenna up on the tower if you have high SWR, because you need to put the back, you need to put it down and go. So this is very important. Put the, the analyze, antenna analyzer, measure the SWR, it must be very low, like 1 to 1.5, between 1.8 and 7 megahertz, and like 1.2 is okay for 10 megahertz and up. It's very common to see 1.1 1, 1 from 1.8 to 3.5 or 4. So, but that's it. So you measure near the ground on a sawhorse or, or anything that you can hold, then you, you, you're good to go. If it's not good to go here, check again if there is any open wire. The only thing could be an open wire because you have a loop, a transformer resistor. Uh, it's, it's very easy to measure the, the resistor. It must be 1,000 ohms, but you're going to see the short circuit of the transform. So if you open, any place you open the loop, you're going to see 1,000 ohms. Well, but what about vertical and horizontal? We had a big discussion about that in the last webinar, but I'm going to try to be short. We still have a lot of slides to go in like half of the time right now. But the, the Waller flag can increase signal to noise ratio up to 13 dB. So if it, this is the signal intensity and here's like one hour uh, sunset or sunrise, and this represents the X signals, like here's the noise floor of your uh, transmit antenna, normally like 5 dB RDF, a vertical or a inverted L. If you use a single flag, like a K9AY, um, you drop like 5 to 6 dB in signal to noise ratio, but you're still not able to listen that the X number 3 or the X number 4 here. It's just like peak and come down, normally what happens when sunset, sunrise. But if you have like a, a vertical other flag, then you can hear the both. I recommend you look into the last a webinar, a little more discussion about this. But if you move to a horizontal wall flag, then really you can reduce main made noise. So the, the horizontal wall flag can have an increase in signal noise ratio between 22 and 30 dB. That, that's really a lot, right? And you can hear things that you cannot hear with the vertical wall flag because you remove the sky wave sorry, we removed the, the ground wave, you only hear sky wave. So noise reduction, uh, very interesting point. When, when you use horizontal wall flag, and uh, if you see here the diagram, you see the green is, is the horizontal and red is the vertical. You see this is minus 50 dB gain and here another 30, so minus 80, so like 80 dB gain attenuation vertical. And if you optimize for maximal re rejection of vertical signal, it means the phasing lines equal, the same lens and the resistor the same, that is going to be even lower. And, there, and this is going to be another 10 dB. So if you, you can look into a video, I put here a link that demonstrate like I had power line noise really close to my place, like 300 feet during a contest, and we use the wall of vert horizontal wall of flag. You really don't hear any. I recommend you to go and check the video. Okay. So this is uh, how it looks like. Very interesting video. Okay. So talking more about the vertical wall of flag and the horizontal wall of flag is the same. Uh, the gain change with the frequency. So if you take a wall of flag this size, this 20 by 10 by 50, this uh, the one I used in this calculation, the gain on 1.6 is minus 43 dB, so almost 44, but the gain on 80 is 28, so there's a big difference between 80 and 1.6. That's because electrically the antenna is bigger and more area, area means more gain. You go to 40 meters, you see just 16 and 10 megahertz. And if you go above 20 meters, see there is a gain. It's a positive gain. This is important because when you use your preamplifier and you did like 4 dB on, on 40, oh sorry, on 160, you really don't need that 
on, on 10 or, or 40 meters because it's too much. So here uh, it's very important aspect of the both water flags, the vertical or horizontal. And here put like a, if you want a model I have here, you can copy these and, and you have the model on, on easy neck. So the same thing with the horizontal water flag is a little different. The thing with horizontal is the horizontal signal cancel above ground. So if you put a horizontal water flag too close to the ground, you need to increase this uh, negative gain. So like if you have uh, the antenna one quarter, and one quarter means different size, like uh, a 60 foot tower is half wave on 40, but it's one quarter on 80, 180, 160. So you have another 60 B. A very good question. Does work a water flag on top of 60 feet tower? Yes, it does. And but there is a when you compare, like we have this on a daily basis. Uh, Ed and 4II operates a water flag here in the Boca Raton DX Club, like 65 or something close to that. And I use mine at 120. So we we hear 90 percent the same. But when there is very quiet and the signal is really at the noise, I can hear first. Or sometimes I, I can hear, he cannot hear, because when the signal is close to the noise floor, that makes difference. But anyway, uh, you can use, even at 60 feet, you're going to have 90% of the time a good reception at 160, even at 60 feet. Of course, if you see 80, there is no limitation at all because above one quarter, you see there is no much, 1.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, so you go more than 120 feet. Now we have water flag at 180 and uh, Wally whisk, whisk 8 Lima Romeo Lima, Wally is pointing at 220 feet high, so uh, it's going to be beautiful to see how this thing works. But of course, if you are limited, you use what you have. So the thing is, if you have a 60 foot tower, really maybe you don't need a big antenna. You can use a small antenna because you are limited by this gain. But for the other hand, a bigger antenna gives you a little more gain. So it's a kind of decision you need to make based on your mechanical restrictions. So what is really the practical gain for a preamplifier? So really on 160 for vertical, you don't need more than 30 dB for horizontal 40 dB, I recommend. So this uh, preamplifier with 6BF981 is very easy to build. You can see the link here. There is a uh, instructions how to build that preamplifier. But there is some consideration we need to take in terms of uh, common mode noise. Uh, for 20 meters, for, sorry, for 80 meters, you, you really need 20 dB for the vertical, like two Nortons, that's they recommend, like the the one for Clifton Labs, they're going to be available for the X engineer very soon, and I recommend like two Nortons. What, what I like to do, like put a filter, filter is very important because you see the antenna chains gain and the, the gain on, on the preamplifier is the same, so you're going to see a very huge signals on 9 megahertz, 12 megahertz on the broadcast band, on, on the higher bands and can generate a lot of noise inside the 160 or 80. So filter is very important. Same thing, isolation and transmit receive, you need at least 80 dB. If you use a 4 dB preamp, 6 dB is not enough for isolation. And of course you need chokes, you need shield, and especially the 12 volts, because most of the chokes does not hold the energy necessary for 160. That's the kind of discussion we're going to have about uh, using high gain preamps. If you think about 40 dB gain, it's 10,000 times, right? So you really need to be careful about shielding. An example, if you have a, a plate, a box, and the wire grows through, like a regular 12 volts con RCA connectors, the 12 volts just right into the box, there is no attenuation. The, the common mode noise on the, on the one side goes just the same way on the other side. So you have no attenuation. If you have a, a feed-through capacitor, sometimes difficult to find a feed-through capacitor. But let's say you find one 1,000 puff. Most of the feed-through capacitors are designed for VHF or UHF. So 1,000 is very high. Most of them is below 500 puffs, if you know what I mean. It's 30 puffs. But if you have 1,000, 
the impedance of 1,000 or 1 nanofarad is just 88 ohms in 1.8, so there is no much attenuation common mode noise. Even if you go 10, it's 8, it's very low. So normally with between 10 and 100, you get like 10 dB attenuation with the signal coming from a free free capacitor. So uh, you have the common mode in one side, you're going to see some common mode on the other side. So you really need like one microfarad of very high capacity. Normally what you use, you use uh, chokes and other kind of circuits to, to really knock down, like my preamp, I have several chokes and several capacitors to really quiet the, this common mode noise coming from the lines. So common mode noise is very complex because on one seek you have a lot of energy and like if you ground the coax and you have magnet field in one side but you don't ground the rotor cable, the magnet field turns in current and current turns in magnet field and you have the common mode noise on the other side. So does not help. Uh, P1 problem, you see a lot of discussion about that, uh, K9, YC, has a beautiful discussion on his website. I recommend you to look at that. So, um, shield is not an option. You need large capacitor, big chokes, steel templates, uh, tin plate boxes. So, it, it's a must. It's not really an option. Uh, what I recommend you to look into this website. Uh, here there is a, a link for this video uh, with Pete. He lives nearby and we did some work removing noise from his stage. He found out beautifully noise coming from the rotor cable, so I recommend you to watch that video and see he put in toroids to, to kill the, the, the noise from the rotor cable. Very interesting reading, uh, very interesting video to watch. So this was the preamp looks like. If you really care about working near the noise floor, you end up here real with SNA connectors, chokes, there are chokes, 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 chokes everywhere, and chokes outside and double shield. So this was what I started with some Norton preamps inside a metal box. This is an N4S preamp inside another metal box. But Valley Flag is really one year project. It's not only the antenna outside, you really need to dig into a shielding. And, and to be very good and low weak signal, you need low noise figures. So that system here put you way below 2 dB noise figure for the system, for the preamp and the radio together. So, but let's talk about weak signal. Uh, we think about thermal noise and S meter for weak signal. We love that thing. We love S meter and see this thing bouncing here. But what it really means? So if you look about signals, like uh, one milliwatt is zero dBm. So one watt is 30 dBm and kilowatt is six. You see a ratio here go uh, 10 by 10, so 1, 10, 10, and here voltage go by 20 times. But if you go to uh, S meter, it's really about signal to noise ratio, and noise is about power. Power it depends on the, the bandwidth. And if you look at the S meter that we used to see, like from 60 to 0, 0 is really here, minus 127 dBm. So if you have a receiver with 20 dB noise figure, most of the receivers today without a preamp give us 20 dB noise figure. And SSB at 2400 hertz, you have the noise floor of the MDS close to 120. That's why the S0 is used for sideband. The old radio start for sideband. But if you go a modern receiver with a preamp, normally drops to 5 dB noise figure. So even SSB, your, your MDF is like 135. If you go with a, no, a, a good receiver and 500 hertz, that gives you 142 dBm, so right here on the SMIRI scale. And if you go 100 hertz, you can do 100 hertz. You see that there is really like six S units below zero. So there is a plenty of room for weak signals and low gain receive antennas. So most of the time on the water flag you don't see much S meter reading because you're operating here. And if you go digital, that's amazing because 
that could be noise figure with one hertz log, the JT65, JTM, uh, it is really the, the bandwidth is one hertz or less because this is a dissemination on the calculation inside the DSP, so it's software based, not hardware, it's a soft defined radio, it's part of the system, so the real bandwidth is like one hertz, so that's why the guy on WSJT can hear really low. So the estimate is good for sideband or to high bands, but on weak signals like 160, you really go down several S units below zero. But why? Uh, a lot of people look at this thing and say, well, this may made noise, and you see a huge amount of noise here. But if you look, like I said, understand the problem, this is our uh, noise, like the red is for residential locations, blue is for rural, and green is for very quiet. Even in 160, between the noise floor and any receiver, this 133, 500 hertz, so it's a very simple receiver, 20 dB noise figure, you still have 40, 47, 42 dB above the noise floor. So you can use Weller flags between minus 40, minus 50. I really don't recommend go more than 60. It's very complicated. But this is main made noise, measured with a vertical. If you go to uh, horizontal weather flag, you remove this local noise and you go into coast skyway. So if you go a little more in details or recommendation ITU RP372-7 radio noise, you're going to see the noise, here is the noise in amplitude, the Kevin, and here is the frequency, and you see that minimum and maximum, it means uh, 99% of the time, 160 is very noisy, you don't need antenna, you just turn on the radio and go watch TV. But during winter time, when there is no electrical activity, actually the only thing that makes noise in 160 is, is thunderstorms, electrical activity, and could be really low. And because propagation is not good, 5% or 1% of the days, mean like 3 or 4 days, like a couple mornings, before the thunderstorm we had, or tomorrow is going to be very quiet. You can see 160 is really quiet. Number 80 or 40, even 10 megahertz, there is more noise because cosmic rays and other things that happen on high band does not impact low bands. So 160 can be really, really low on the winter time. That's why you need a very low noise figure. So like a 7800 without preamp is 20 dB. So when I use my system, it's 0.5 dB preamp, and with a 4 dB gain, and I, I get the noise floor like 1.4. That's uh, the whole system. But if you go that low, shielding, ground, isolation is really critical. And that's a very important aspect. I know it's running another 10 minutes, but we need to go deep on that part. So uh, here we are. You have the rotor cable, you have your antenna, you have the AC lines, the uh, cable TV, telephone lines, the other stuff. Uh, you hook your antennas, you have antenna for 10 meters, for 6 meters, and you have your transmit antenna. Actually, I'm going to tell you that's not much difference between those wires and the transmit antenna 160. There is a lot of energy. You can almost light a bulb near sunset in my tower. You could there's a lot of energy coming from this thing, but this thing is 120 feet high, and the rotor cable for my 6 meter antenna is 120, and the, the antenna for 2 meters is 35, uh, 100, 105. So all the wires that we have here capture the same energy from the transmit antenna, and common mode noise is the voltage between the wires and the common ground. The ground, not that being behind the amplifier or behind the radio is here on the ground. So this is the circuit. So all wires 90 feet or 30 dB long are 106 meter antennas. It does not have the impedance to feed, but capture the same level energy and put everything up in here ground station. All those energy coming here on those wires and go to this ground and then get up into the AC line from the rotor, come back, 
like I told about the, the video of the rotor, you're going to understand that loop. When you see P disconnecting the AC from the rotor, you see the noise coming down on the receiver. Very interesting stuff. So, basically, uh, how many antennas do you have for 160? It's not the only one you, you feed. It's all the wires you have around. And, and let's go a little more deep on that thing. So, choke is your best friend. You really choke. So, some, some recommendations how to reduce noise to receivers on this website for Whiskey 3 Echo, 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 beautiful site. Some examples of chokes. Uh, of course, there is the master you can get uh, from, from uh, K9AY Gym. It's fantastic work on, on chokes and also uh, H1, uh, HIS, beautiful reading. And a very important part, choke is your best friend, but common mode noise runs outside the shield. If you open the shield anywhere, the noise gets inside, and you don't have a choke. So take care when you buy stuff and look stuff like this. Few inches, one eight or three millimeters of exposed wire is enough to the energy from outside get inside. So it doesn't matter how this thing measure in the lab on the real life when they put outside it doesn't work because the shield get inside any little opening. I always say the same story. Doug was testing his roller flag and there was an RCA connector. One wing, there was not good contact and there was a lot of noise. He almost gave up with the antenna in 2003 and there was a gap really small, not even big like that thing you see here on the back of the, the connector. When he fixed that thing, the noise goes away and we have a water flag. And it's very critical, believe me. One millimeter, 132 gap is enough to the shield to be open and the noise to get inside. So let's think a little more about why it's so complex. So let's take an example of a Iagi, a tri-bender. We have a director, a driven element, a reflector. The energy for the driven element is irradiated. That's what's called driven. The energy goes and irradiates. So the energy comes to the reflector. What happened? The reflector gets the energy, but there is no loss. So all the energy they send back to the air and re-radiate. And the same thing with the driven element. So if you think about uh, the reflector with the phase like minus one and the front with the minus plus, plus one, actually it's not like this, but the result is the same. Like you have a forward gain and a front back. So the things adds together. I don't want to go deep in mathematics on this thing, but just make sure the graphical is enough for you to understand. So the maximum interaction is when this is half wave on the frequency you are operating. And the minimum is one quarter. So I'll leave again an example. Here is like an easy neck. I put three towers, one is one eight, one quarter, one quarter and half. So this is like um, 120, 120, this is 60. This is uh, like 240. And this is the source. This is the only one that is transmitting. Look at the current on the vertical here. It's very high. almost looks like the balls are transmitted. It's just the, this one source here. There's almost no current here on half wave that's too big or this small one. It's too short. Actually, if you think about the dipole, dipole is half wave, but it's one quarter here, one quarter here. If you think about vertical, uh, one quarter is another quarter reflecting side makes the half wave. So this thing is really resonant. So when you think about half wave dipole on vertical, you need to cut by two. So if you have a tower, this is 120, and another tower 120, you transmit with both towers. Doesn't matter if you just feed your coax in one tower. The two towers are working at the same time. A big tower is not and a small tower is not. But of course, this is based on frequency. If we talk about 80 meters, here is going to be like 20 feet, 20 feet, 20 meter high or 65, 75 feet. This will be 35, this will be 120. So it changes when you change frequency, but that's the concept. And this physical law happens with all receive antennas. doesn't matter what kind of receive antenna you have. That happens. That, that's physical, right? So let's see about the Weller flag. Weller flag has 
uh, low gain, so the signal is very low. So the DX signal coming to the weather flag and coming for a transmit tower. It depends on the freak, like I told you, but there is a reflection back. So it means the signal and your receiver antenna is coming for two different directions. If this uh, detuning is not much interaction here, you're going to see something like this. This is actually measured, right? This is measured. And you see here a little bounce. And this is because uh, that signal reflected. Depends on, on how intensely, how good is the tuner or not. And you get a little more or even really more. So this is vertical and this is vertical. If you have like horizontal water flag and vertical transmit antenna, there is like a 27 dB isolation for polarization. That's why this applies for vertical but does not apply for horizontal. And in both cases, you have the distance, so as, as far as you can go. So in, in my case, the tuning antenna, you can get up to 30 dB reduction in this ray radiation noise. So how the thing looks like? If you do right, you get a water flag like this. is actually measure the water flag. So uh, how the thing degradate? All these things end up on the front of the preamp, and, and if you have uh, Transmit signal leaking, remember I told about transmit signal and relays and common mode noise. The thing makes in the front of preamp and it's just 20 dB below the water flag signal, right? This is a weak signal. This thing's that's very weak. That's why 60 dB isolation and transmit receive is not enough. You see this kind of deterioration when you measure. If you get a little more, you're gonna see this kind of pattern. You see the green one here? And if you get 20, you, you just don't see anything. And you say, oh, my receive antenna here is exactly the same as my transmit antenna. And that is high angle. So there's nothing to do with this. It's really uh, interaction of common mode noise, right? So uh, open frame relays, plastic box, open shield, doesn't matter. The audio work you put together and build the water flag, if you don't care about those things, uh, does not work. And remember, the preamp is part of the radio, not part of the antenna. So the preamp and grounding must be very close to the radio. Otherwise, all those problems going to really amplify itself. So here's an example how to measure the water flag. Here's the same water flag as my transmit antenna here, my receiver antenna 60 feet. This I, I collect the plot. I'm going to tell a little about collecting the plot. and. I put a jumper here, so I ground it. So instead of detuned, the towers become tuned. And I measure again, a few minutes later, that's the diagram I get. So beautiful water flag, but if you don't care about your structures, your transmit antenna, that's what you're going to get. Don't, don't lose your time if you don't think about that. But that's good because w when you detune your tower, it's good for everything. It's like an example about detuning the tower, one, one I could say from, from Jay. Uh, Whiskey Zero X Bravo for resolution, put a beautiful paper on, on the NCJ, National Contest Journal. It's still available on the web, you just look in there. Uh, Tom put a good discussion, and it's not that complicated like this. We're going to see more about the Unipole. But uh, to detune the tower, just get a tower like 125, two feet apart, put a wire 30 to 120 feet. So it doesn't matter how high, it could be small, at least 30. Uh, maybe 24 is going to work, that's not a big deal. Then you put a capacitor here, and you put an MFJ. You open that loop, and, and you measure and adjust for minimal resistance, so the thing be resonant. So then, electrically, you isolate that part. So then you put the jumper back when you remove the meter. So, for doing this, all cables must be inside the tower. Everything must be grounded at the top and the bottom, right? And and if you're going to transmit, like where I use so, a uh, skirt, three wires, and a detuning capacitor, you you can tune with 200 ohms. So that tower, if you're in one quart wave, it's going to be very broadband. It can go for two megahertz, but 1.8 to two megahertz, very low SWR. I have another tower for 80 that can go for 3.5 to four megahertz. The whole band below 1.4 SWR. So there's some advantage using that technology with the skirts and and tuning that way because you get a very broad band antenna and you remove noise. So remember to use the same material if you want to create noise like we discussed before. Uh, I recommend you to look into this video we put together today about uh, 
effects of the tuning the tower. So this I recommend you go to the website and watch that video. You see uh, how we we detune uh, NHPR P the tuning his his antenna put like a unipole like this one and this diagram, and you see signals. You're gonna see like three or four DX signals. How you can copy signals to the noise floor that was not able to copy the tuning the tower. And his tower is 150 feet far from the, the receiver antenna. It's not like 60 miles, but I recommend you look at that. So again, if you look about uh, everything you have, like a 10 meter dipole or 6 meter, 2 meters, and you have like 120 feet of cable, that's really a 160 meter antenna, right? And you have common mode noise, re radiate, so you really need to care about that. So it's, it's not from only the wall effects, any antenna on 160, you need to care about this because this happened because the broadcast energy on 80 and 20, that everything is too big, you don't have that much energy, but on 160 and 80, you, you, you do have that, thing. you need to care. So changing the impedance here on the cable does not change the physical length of the wire is still 40 meter wide. If you put a short circuit, if you change, you open, doesn't matter. You, you need to physically open that thing and remove from the ground. So an easy way to kill your receiver, put like a low dipole or a one quart wave elevator radius, you really kill that stuff. Well, why we know that? Because we can measure. So how we can measure this thing? We can use a polar plot. Polar plot, a beautiful tools for G4HFQ, you can download the polar plot, you can use a, a signal from a broadcast or somebody can send a vertical signal, you can set up the radio in CW trying to remove the modulation, put HAC off, then you, you calibrate uh, the input, make sure that everything is linear, you don't have overload in any part, and you adjust the rotation. So read the instructions, it's very important when you download the software. And of course then you collect the data, you start the rotor and the program at the same time, and you really plot. So I recommend download the software, install Polar Plot, read the instruction, and also read uh, Whiskey Echo 3 Echo Echo Echo. There's a beautiful article about evaluation receive antenna with sound cards. I learned a lot with this article. So I really recommend this reading. It's like a must-read website. So when you take a polar plot and you see things like this, actually this audio saturation, you see there is no linear. Something is saturated. You don't have an antenna this perfect round like this. Uh, when you have distortion like this, don't think take much time looking to your antenna. It's not really the antenna. It's the signal is reflect for different directions. Don't assume because you know the broadcast, the signal can be bouncing in any, uh, like say, cell phone tower, 300 feet, 1,000 feet away, and signal coming from two different directions. But if you have a common mode noise, normally this is kind of diagram you get. So, uh, Rotatable antenna is nice because you really can measure and evaluate. So you don't see things like I showed today on, on other antennas because you, you cannot turn a beverage, but the thing is there. Of course, the beverage has high outputs. So it's not so low gain, but the care about common mode noise, you see situations like, oh, uh, one beverage works better than another one. It's really about common mode noise and interaction with things. Try to neutralize the towers, you're going to see a huge improvement in whatever you have. So uh, here, like examples of measuring evaluated water flag, so this is a horizontal water flag measuring 40. Very difficult to get a horizontal signal for a water flag, so 160 meters, very difficult to get a signal to measure 80, the same, so this is really measured, horizontal water flag measured uh, with polar plot, so you see here, collect data. Uh, you put in here on the rotation time, the, how many times take to one turn. Take care, sometimes the rotor in one direction is not the same in the other direction. Then we start the rotor and it start collecting data at the same time, they start starting plotting. When you finish, you can uh, rescale this spike and smooth, make it beautiful like this, and you can save it. So then you can know, like, uh, this, like on this side here is like one, 80 meters, trying to measure 80 meters, not so easy. 
Uh, here is like a, a 80 meter mesh with a 80 meter three element Yagi from PT90 Zulu Echo. So it's really the actual diagram. So there is no guess if things work. But if you measure a horizontal water flag with a vertical signal, you're going to measure the vertical pattern. So you're going to see that kind of pattern. And this is the front of the antenna, is the back. So when you compare with polar plot, you really can measure, like an example. Here, when, when we switch between uh, horizontal and vertical, it's during the day, a very quiet place, and we're switching between the vertical wall effect and horizontal wall effect. You see how much the noise drops. So normally it drops like 30 dB. So a good test for wall effect during noon time when it's, there is quiet weather, there is no ground wave, you connect a 4 dB preamp on your radio. The S meter should be close to zero. Summer radius is 1, 1 1.5 maximum, but normally should be zero. Most of the S meters are calibrated with the internal preamp. So you turn off the internal preamp. You don't need the internal preamp. Just the 4 dB outside. Uh, also, when you connect the water flag into that preamp during the day, there is no increase in noise. It should be zero. So even a 4 dB gain in front of the radio, I connect antenna and there is no increase in noise because there is no sky wave noise. That's the way you know that things are working. So if you have more noise, you have work to do. You need to put chokes, grounding, and remove common mode noise. And that's possible. So it's visible and you get results. So that's measuring with polar plot is important. And of course, uh, results is the best way to see. You got uh, good contacts like this beautiful card for one six in the city lot. So uh, it's possible. You don't need to buy uh, 80 acres on on the woods, and nice to have, but you can do here if you want. Uh, we have technology for that, just care about things that I put together today, like 10 years of experience on those things. I hope you, you can enjoy. And if you read uh, these slides, you're going to see a little more information about historic evolution of the water flag and several good details, and a lot of people make a lot of contribution in things like pre-war. So at this point, I'm going to get back to Ken. I hope you guys are uh, still there. Yep. <laughs> sure. So I have a little more time, but I think you can go for questions, Ken. Okay, very good. And you might want to have your slides ready in case we need to refer back to those. So uh, thank you very much, JC. I know there's a ton of information to pass along. Um, so we will take some questions now. Um, we've got a little bit of time here. I've got two right now, and if there are any others, go ahead and send those in, and we'll uh, try to knock these out in quick order. So the first one comes from Richard, and he's wondering, can you use a pair of wires from a Cat5 network cable for the phasing lines? Absolutely. That's the really good. I use for a lot, but you really need to strip. If you take the cable, the Cat5, there is a nylon inside. You put this thing in, 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 a, in, a, in a tool, don't, don't cut yourself. You can strip. You pull that stuff and it cuts the, the cables and you open it. And you can use them. You can, but uh, the thing is, does not last longer on the weather, right? And you cannot go close to metal or close to the ground. That needs to be like one or two feet far from the ground and far from things. But works really well. I remember PY2XB did the expedition to Fernando Noronha, asked him to use that. He put a loop like 200 feet far from the station and the, 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 the 100 ohms from the CAT5 was putting one back to back to get 100. And that thing was quiet. There was noise completely quiet. Even get inside the, the station with all computers and all kind of stuff, there was no zero pickup of noise. And that worked. Also, uh, we had the expedition in Afghanistan, Tango, Lim, Tango 6, Lima, Fox, if I'm correct, I don't remember exactly. But he was not able to hear anybody. And he was there for two months. Then I sent him instructions to use a, a cable from, from internet. He took the cable open and twisted pair and he put it and he worked like 1200 Qs and 160 in, in the last two weeks of his stay on Afghanistan. So it's, it's very useful, especially on the expedition, use it. Of course, it does not last longer, but uh, you can do But you need one pair each time. You cannot have two 
pairs of, or, or four, take the cable, use two, and let the other stuff there. You need to remove, just use one cable, because the capacitors between the cables and the ground, that does the balance and, and cut the common mode noise. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, next question, back. yeah, is uh, from Joe WB9 Sugar Bravo Delta, and this is actually a good question because I think we've got uh, some people uh, here that are uh, broadcast band uh, shortwave or um, SWL uh, enthusiasts. Um, and the question is, uh, have you tried scaling the flag to be useful antenna for the new coming 160? I'm sorry, 630 meter band. So, kind of you know below 160 and down to 630 meters if you looked at the flag for anything uh, lower than like 1.8 megahertz. Yeah, everything applies, but it's going to be big because you need to take the frequency 600, right, divided by 10 to get 60. So, it's still not that big, it's, it's doable, right, but you cannot want to cover. Don't believe you cover with uh, 8 by, so let's say, 30 feet diameter or you need to go 10, 110 of the wavelength. It's 600 meters divided by 10 means 60 meters. So you need to have at least um, uh, almost 60 meters is like 180 feet of loop to, to get one loop. And if you get this thing apart, of course, you, you can you can have a weather flag with that and be very directive. Actually, on, on Winnegan, did exactly that. So, if I see if I can show you here, uh, I, need, I need to go, I think, on the, on the last slide. I think I need to go to the last slide. Hold on a second here. Uh, one, I think... Oh, I don't think I have in this slide. In the other presentation, I do have. But uh, the early days, they used to have those loops uh, big like a thousand feet each side and 300 feet high. So um, it's really possible, but you expect to have a, a really uh, uh, a, a big loop. So you can expect to have this thing here like uh, 180 feet of wire. If you go use, also works because then you have half, you don't need everything, right? So a U like this is going to work as well. You have two, actually this article for Freud is U for two or two for U. You, have, you can face two of these things and it's going to work well. I hope I did answer your question. Okay, great. Um, another question from uh, James here. Uh, if, whoop, hang on. Uh, if connecting the Waller flag to the radio does not increase the noise level, does that say that there is not enough uh, antenna gain? No, there is there is no signal at all. It means if you have a horizontal Waller flag that has 90 dB reduction on vertical signals, and during the day, only thing you have is vertical. You don't have sky waves on on 160 during the day. Everything is ground wave. So, if you have 90 dB, the ground wave goes way below the, the gain. That's the thing. You, you, you want to remove ground wave. If you have a vertical water flag, you don't have the issue because you, you hear the vertical noise, right? And, and that's what you can expect from vertical. You see a 10 to 15 dB decrease in noise comparing with the vertical. But when you go horizontal, you have this cancellation of ground wave. And that's what you see in the video. If you see my video about contest with power line noise, it's really a lot. So that, that's the way you choose the size of the antenna, the gain uh, for your location. If you know how much noise you have, if it's a noisy place, you, you need an a, antenna big enough to the vertical signal goes below the sensitive the receiver, so you don't hear the noise. That's the, that's the thing. The noise is always there, but it's below the sensitivity. And at night, when you have sky waves, then we can work and, and, and enjoy a very quiet propagation signal. And, and signals coming 
from the sky on horizon, especially when six is a different band. Sometimes the horizontal signal peaks in different directions in different time from the vertical. It's very common that I hear like deep in Asia from 90 degree, is point my antenna towards uh, North Africa. But if I use vertical, I need to point my antenna to uh, zero degree or 10 or 12 degree. So if in the morning, sometimes the horizontal signal 160 coming from VK6, uh, 210 degree. Uh, half an hour before uh, sunrise, but near sunrise, sometimes the horizontal signal disappear and have vertical signals coming from 270 degree. So uh, th that's the the trick of water flag, and the way I measure if I get rid of all the common mode noise is connecting the water flag like 12, 1 p p.m. Connect. To and disconnect, it looks like I don't have antenna. And I look outside, oh, the antenna is there. So I, I play. then you measure the SWR, and the antenna is there. But that's the way you test the horizontal water flag if it's working. OK, let's try and knock out uh, these last couple of questions here. Um, and you may want to go back to one of your charts, I think, had this. Um, how much advantage on height uh, is the horizontal uh, flag uh, compared to 30 foot, 60 foot, that sort of thing? Um, uh, let's see here. Let's go back to that. The, the diagram here. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that yeah. Right. I think so. That's it. Uh oh, light show. Yeah. Okay, so. Here is the gain above ground. So if you look practical, we have towers normally 30, 60, and 120. And there is some contestation that goes way up, like A3LR, Wiskeco 3 Charlie, uh, Wally, get us 200, uh, K9CT also has 180 something. But normally you get like those measurements. So. Uh, if you have a 60 foot tower and you have one quart wave above ground for 80, so one quart wave above ground for 80, there was almost no problem with the horizontal water flag, so there's no limitation. So normally 40 and 80 and 30, uh, 30 feet is going to work well. Actually, I have friends that has antennas at 45 and work really good on 80, but does not work so well on 160. 160, you, you get down down here. If you go that like another 12 dB down, what it means is not the antenna doesn't work. What it means the noise floor is 12 dB down. So you, your signal is going going down. If you go like on the estimator stuff, let's see if I can get the estimator here. Uh, what is the estimator? Sorry for that. Uh, I'm going too fast and losing the estimator. But normally, when you go to the, the the noise floor, there is a point where you cannot. Or what is the the estimator? Ah, here. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, if if you have a CW are here, right, and uh, your antenna is 60 feet, there is a point where your gain is going to park here. It means your signal is going to be below that. And if you have the antenna higher, you still have some room to amplification of the signal. In practice, um, even at 45 feet, you can work most of the, the DX. So if you think about Europe, if you think about VK here from the US, that kind of distance, when you, the guy has a signal that bounces the S meter, like S2, S3, you're going to work them, even local guys. Even the antenna at 30 feet, you're going to work them. Actually, uh, Wally was testing his weather flag, and it was two feet above ground, and he was making comparisons with, with uh, the beverage. But there was strong signal, and he lives a very quiet place. The thing is, 
when you get weak signal, you try to work zone 17 or something further, you can gonna see the signals really coming to uh, where is my pointer here? Uh, you're gonna see signals really coming down here, and then it's, a, it's a, a, about duration, how much noise you have, and how much headroom you have, because you need to be at least 3 dB above the noise floor to get CW and 10 dB to get a sideband. So uh, practically, uh, 60 feet you can you can do well with 60 feet, right? But uh, don't expect to work uh, 300 countries in the 60 feet. You can do the XCC. You can you can work a, a good contest. If you want to really go to 300 countries, like most of guys wants to to go 300, you need the Waller flag 120. But at 60 feet, like we have here in uh, in 4 II working almost everything they are work. Of course, if you go down to VK0, a very, very weak signal, probably he was not able to hear. But uh, at 60 feet, I remember uh, Ed re telling me that he heard Japan without a preamp, right into the radio, the water flag, without the preamp, connect to the radio, he was able to, to, to copy Japan. Remember, uh, without the preamp, means the noise figure instead of 2 was 20, but was enough because the, the red room was, was 20 dB. If you look on the chart, that's why I recommend you to to, to look in the, the, the charts here. Uh, yeah, let's back here. If you look at the noise floor, right, when you go from 20 dB to 5 dB noise figure, you drop the same 15 dB here, you see the 15 dB coming here, so the noise just adds up. There's a lot of stuff to talk about noise, but you need to understand more temperature, but uh, the practical aspect or how high is is how much the X you want to work, right? And let's get back to that point. Hold on. So don't fix much and what is the minimum DX you can hear, fix much, how, how much you can use, right? So definitely even here with 60 feet or between 30 and 60, you still get a lot of DX to work and you have the directivity, you knock down uh, the local noise and you lock down the, the thing, but you expect uh, signals that you need to put a little more gain on the preamp on, on inside the radio or the volume. I think, do, do I think I answered the question, Ken? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay, I've got one more here um, and hopefully you can just give a short answer because we're uh, pretty much out of time. Um, okay. And it's from uh, Press and Success. That's wondering about, the, is it practical to interlace uh, one of these with uh, 15 and 20 meter Yagi's? Well, it is. Uh, the thing is, it's not resonant, and the two loops are phased 180 degrees, so there is no irradiation because one cancels the other. You can go to uh, Doug's w website. I think I, I put like a, a, a here on, on Doug. You can go to his website. You see a lot of photos. You go in here. There is a session called Photo. You're gonna see. Uh, all the water flags interlaced with 6 meters, 20 meters, 40 meters, and even uh, K9 UWA John Guler, he put a five elements, 10 meter yag in the same boom. So if you see the beautiful video he has on the web and also uh, how it works, I make a little longer so he was able to put the 10 meter yag elements inside the water flag. Uh, here on the X Club, we have a six meter Yagi inside the water flag. Uh, most of the installations has uh, water flag and Yagis together. You see a little change in SWR, like in the case of John, you sharing the same boom. Uh, the minimum SWR was 28.3, and with the water flag was 28.4. So, but it's still 
same same as our 1.12 something like this with just a little move so there is some interaction it's not zero but uh, not a noticeable you need really to measure to note something and I have more than 30 installed right now inside mass in different towers next to 40 meters uh, 20 uh, and and uh, does work. When you need to care is really the isolations. If you put like five kilowatts or let's say no, I don't I don't say that. If you put like fifteen hundred watts on the on twenty meter Yagi, you expect some some energy on the wall effect. That's why I recommend ten ten kilowatts isolation and ten watts resistor. Ten watts enough, you're never gonna burn that. Remember the gain is low, right? So uh, and it cancel each other, so there is no much energy in or out the water flag, but of course you need to care about that. You don't want to get uh, too much energy back to the receiver when you transmit the receiver, so this switching is important to do the protection, but it doesn't work with minimum interaction. I think that's, that's the answer to the question. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Stu VE2XX has a question specific to um, a, a flag that he's building. Um, I'm going to ask him to email the question to you if you could just uh, handle it because we're uh, we're way late on time here, and I uh, I think uh, yeah. I mean his question is a good one. If if you wouldn't mind taking this one offline, is that okay, JC? Well, uh, I'm going to try. I cannot guarantee they can do it. Uh, hey, that's right, right. I put this presentation right. There's a, there's a lot of things because I really have a lot more projects going on. I cannot get another project. Okay, you, let me here. Let me ask you this real quick. Then I say he's built a flag last uh, July. Used Easy Neck to maximize the front to back. The R values were like 580 ohms and 560 ohms. Uh, front to back is about 20 dB. Um, do I have to match the transformers to 600 ohms? That's the question. And uh, why did you say 1,000 ohms? I used Easy Neck to find the RDF value. Is this the correct way? Well, it is and it is not. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, here it's, and why I'm saying that. Um, okay, so let's go here. And I'm going to show you, I think it's a very important question. I want to answer that. See, uh, look at these two lobes on the back of the antenna, right? When you play the resistor, you're really changing that angle. If you think the maximum is that green point, 120, you measure an easy neck, like this one, that front back is really at that angle. So if you take the angle here, you got this front back. So when you play the resistor, you look in 3D. You always need to look in 3D. You're going to see that angle changing in a way that can be really low and it has just one lobe or here with two lobes and sometimes you got even three. But you don't really change anything with the antenna itself. You don't want to hear weak signal because that 20 degree nu is here or if there is uh, a here. Actually, I prefer that node to be very close to the ground and cut some local noise. But if you look in here, that part of the energy is way below the front, so you don't have increase on uh, directivity or digging signal or the noise. What I think about getting close to 900 ohms is because the loop itself does not have reactance. On the papers, everything is beautiful because you have a perfect transmission line and nothing happened. But when you go to the field and you put a spectrum analyzer or oscilloscope in those loads and measure, like I did several times, any imbalance on the line changes the current to one side and another. And the actual pattern is distorted. But that's what nice about the Weller flag. You get a polar plot. You can measure and see how bad it is. If you if you do it right, you can use 500 ohms, no problem. Change the, the, the transformer like uh, Lewis, EV3PRK, just put a beautiful archer. I recommend you go to his website. Uh, he, he, he has a, uh, a low uh, SWR in everything, and he's preparing his polar plot. So when you took the polar plot, you know 
what you have. That's what a beautiful about rotate one So what I like about uh, 900 ohms, at first you can go from 80 to 40 to 30 and you don't change much. But in real life, if you get a reactance in the loop, uh, the, 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 phasing, the phasing line is not really 100, it's not uh, real, there is a, a big reactance on the, on the phasing line. And also the way we mix the two lines together in the center, right? Everything works well if you have low SWR. So that's why I try to keep uh, as much as I can. Let's see if I can go there on the phasing line. Yeah, uh, everything is beautiful, right? But if you don't have low SWR, the energy from this side reflects to the other side, the co-isolation. So there's actually a big discussion once with the Dr. Dallas in terms of put a, a, magical, a T, magical T here or some kind of uh, duplex that can isolate the two sides like a uh, a magical T or a combiner, right? But if you have the right impedance, you don't need that. You just go straight. But uh, that's why I recommend 100, uh, 1,900. Of course, if you do everything right, you have 100 ohms, the, the loop is everything balanced, and you measure, you get the result. So that's why I like about polar prod. You measure, you know what you have. I think I answered that question. Yeah, okay, very good. All right, thanks for taking that. Um, so, we'll... Uh, oh, uh, it says, and his lines are equal lengths, uh, I would think. Is that correct? Uh, that's from Stuart. Uh, well, there, there is a discussion about that here. Uh, you can choose. Uh, I recommend same lens, right? Uh, right here, when I talk about that, no, before. If you go the back a little longer, you go like 175, you get a little better, um, I don't remember what it is here, but there is a specific slide about that, I think it's right, it's right here. If you go 180, yeah, here's the discussion about the, the resistors, remember if you go a little more on the back, so the back resistor 10 to 24 ohms bigger than the front resistor, you get like 175 degree phase, you increase front back but you decrease directivity. If you go the opposite way you, you, and put the small on the back and the big on the front, you're going to do the opposite way, you're going to increase directivity and decrease front back. And the, the phase is the same, if it was the two the same, I think it's really nice, little broadband. But if you little like a little more front back, you can go 175. I don't let you go more. You increase the front back, you decrease. So the, the line on the back is always two to three feet longer. That's why I put here a front line equals the back line two to four feet. That that's enough. You don't need we don't need more than this, right? Uh, if if you want to keep some more front back. Okay, okay, looks like we got his question. Thank you very much, JC. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, thank you once again for the wonderful presentation. I know a lot of work has gone into this um, and, um, you know, your willingness to, to share this with the community is uh, is great. Uh, um, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you much for your time. Is there anything else you want to add before we close it up here? Oh, just try. Remember, hum rate is about building things, about put your hands on, on the thing and try. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Just try and it's like a one-year project like I told you. You really need to dig in removing noise, but you really can hear really good in a city lot like you are in the island on the Bahamas if you do things right. And in spots, you can check here, like an APR uh, is hearing as good as I am. And a lot of stuff I mentioned here, you're going to see in his videos, and worth the sacrifice to do it, because you're going to enjoy really good DX and all low bands, 160, 80, 60 meters, 40, 30. Th that's my take. Try and do it. Get outside. Do it something. And if the uh, results are anything close to what you have, uh, they will uh, have uh, spent their again. time spent their time well. <laughs> do, it, do it again. Read again. Go to the, the archives. 
yep. read the stuff. There's always something to read. There's always something to spend time. It's a beautiful sure. part of home reading. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, this presentation is recorded. Uh, the presentation itself and uh, the slides will be posted on the WWROF webpage under the uh, webinar archive uh, link. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. I had a great turnout tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Uh, JC, thanks again so much. Uh, 73s, everyone. So long. Bye-bye.